This is uh, Robert uh, Stark. I'm joined here with uh, Paul Bingham. We're going to be discussing a documentary project that he has. Uh, it's about basically chronicalizing the death of the American uh, heartland. Uh, Paul, it's great having you back on. It's uh, been a while. Uh, thank you, Robert. It's great to be back on. And yes, the project is tentatively called The Death of the American Heartland about uh, the dis economic destruction and decay of the central part of the Americas and the southern part of the Americas. And for the people in the audience who are new to this and they haven't listened to the shows that you did in the past, can you give the audience a brief introduction to yourself? Yeah, I'm a writer, poet, and uh, lately I've been trying my hand at uh, filmmaking. I've written a couple of books. Uh, that are currently available on Amazon. One is uh, Down Where the Devil Don't Go, and the other one is called Black House Rocked. And uh, <clears throat> I have a book of poetry in the works that will be out any year now that is called Strip Club Poetry. And uh, I'm all, I uh, travel a lot for uh, in my business. And uh, Oh, were you able to use the the picture of the painting that I sent you for that book on poetry, strip club poetry? Yeah, I'm going to. I mean, that's art by Robert Stark, um, cover art, but it's, I just never have published it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's that's a done deal. Have you gotten footage for the documentary so far? It's based on your travels through different parts of the Midwest and the South. Where have you gone? Oh, I primarily travel through Kansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, Nebraska, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and uh, Alabama, Louisiana. So you've gotten footage? Have you interviewed people? I have a lot of interviews. I have a lot of footage. Uh, I'm wanting to, at this time, do some more orderly interviews because... Everything heretofore has been shot in a very haphazard manner because I, being as I'm traveling and I want to do some focused and planned uh, shooting uh, for the documentary and interview some people of note uh, who are living in the heartland as well and do some formal interviews. I'm sure it's more difficult during the during the quarantine, but. In the future, there'll be more opportunities. Well, I traveled uh, to Indiana just before this all started. I'm known as essential, and that's the term that's really bothered me since the beginning of this, because what most people don't realize is most people aren't essential, and that's the, that's we're, we're determining at this time, due to the coronavirus outbreak, who is and this quarantine, who is actually essential and who is non-essential. And the non-essential people we find are people who are usually economic units that are not valuable to the status quo. And I've interviewed many of these people uh, in past times. They might have been considered valuable because for their consumption ratios, but uh, in other words, how much they can consume. But now we're not really needing consumers to prop up the economy anymore. So these people are basically unessentials. And in, in other words, if you're not essential, you may be disposable. And I think that's what we're seeing right now is that the determination whether people in the United States, in the heartland, are either essential or disposable. And the quarantine is just, uh, it's just much more, much more open about it. And it's kind of accelerates the process in, in, in that way. Are you familiar with that book, uh, Bullshit Jobs and the Bullshit Jobs Theory? Yeah. And I honestly believe that it's a lot of, a lot, and this goes back to people who will unironically quote Buckminster Fuller, whom I, whom I know you're familiar with, I'm talking about make work jobs back in the 60s and 70s. And at the same time, they herald the advent of feminism and women in the workplace, and not and that this that's not necessarily germane to our subject at hand. But what you quickly find is that most 
people who are non-essential are often women, and a lot of jobs that are that are currently exist today are that are deemed unessential or not essential are jobs designed for women. So I don't know. I've I've heard different theories because there, like there was that whole concept of like a man session about how economic changes were disproportionately uh, harming men, and then. I've also heard that women were disproportionately to be laid off during the quarantine, so I've actually heard uh, different theories. But the thing is, also like with the whole economic model, is there's the cultural aspect of feminism, and then there's just the economic practicality that one that basically one head of a household can't support a family. Yeah, it's impossible in the heartland for one individual on even a well above minimum wage to support a poor person household of a, a unit of mother, father, and two children. And so you can make $15 an hour, you can make $20 an hour. It's not necessarily going to be adequate because the power of the dollar, dollar in every sense is so atrophied that you have to make $40 in order to an hour to, uh, to have a semi-decent existence. Even once the quarantine is over, uh, a lot of these jobs will probably be gone for gone for good. You will see a lot of a lot of corporations are, are streamlining, and the people they laid off they won't necessarily rehire. We'll see definitely a trend and increase and acceleration of the trend of automation. I I I, I that's going to be a very interesting near future to observe. And uh, that's something I was going to talk a little bit about because one of the things I do is often I get bored traveling and I travel on different roads. And uh, there are a lot of restaurants that probably won't be reopening that were struggling before the coronavirus hit. And having the restaurants, this quarantine, go on and be sh being shut down with no savings or any kind of... of uh, monetary uh, support aside from the Trump bucks uh, so-called they're going to go out of business and there are a lot of tourist venues in the Midwest that are also going to go out of business. I think most of the important businesses are going to be able to maintain for now but nevertheless we are seeing a period in which a lot of businesses that Trump heralded were going to come back this factories and so forth, are actually continuing their, their slow death. So What's actually words, happened with uh, Trump is he did put some sanctions on China, but those jobs, they're basically going to other nations other than China, like India and Vietnam. Very few of them have actually come back to America. Yes, and you'll see, like last year, there were a lot of factories that, said, that put out signs, we are hiring, but... And in, in big banners, you know, Trump, Trump's got the economy going. We're hiring again, you know, all these uh, various steel uh, fabrication and other factors. But they're not hiring general workers. But uh, they kind of put those banners out because most of those small factories are pro owners are pro-Trump. And so they're putting out the, like, we're putting America back to work and all that. But as a matter of fact, they're only hiring a few specialists. They're not just op doing a big business and needing to double their labor force or even increase their labor force. What they're hiring is specialists. But nevertheless, they're going to pull out this huge banner like, we're, we're putting America back to work. So it, it was kind of a fraud that uh, went on last year, and it created a bubble of people thinking that, we were approaching uh, something closer to full employment, which, in fact, we were not, as this coronavirus and the quarantine has proved, proven. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Were you an initial supporter of Trump, or were you skeptical of him from the very beginning? I had stuff going on in the 2016 election, so I missed most of it. Like, I, I had uh, business interests, and so I really paid very little attention I predicted Trump would lose in uh, lose the primaries and the general election, so I was totally off base with Trump. But again, I wasn't paying a great deal of attention. As long as we're on the subject of elections, I will tell you: in all my travels, 
I was on a road in Oklahoma, and I saw one Yang sign, one Yang Gang sign, and it was kind of funny. <laughs> Not in a just in, a, in an amusing way because that was the only Yang Gang sign I'd ever run across. <laughs> I was I almost pulled in and talked to the people. Oh yeah, were you a Yang supporter? I I didn't really. I'm not really uh, into pr- the professional wrestling anymore. I mean, I I, I supported Ron Ball, but I I just don't do professional wrestling anymore. You know, but I I thought Yang had a good platform, and I was certainly enjoyed his spiel and his uh, a lot of his ideas. I just felt like he he made a few major mistakes in not in he wasn't able to pull significant support away from Bernie and that was his primary problem. But I think Yang failed to realize because he is a very earnest individual that he simply did not have a proper audience. And what I mean by that is that you have to work with such dregs of society when you're campaigning in either party and isn't that Americans, for the most part, are dregs in general, so he had such poor material to work with. In other words, the people he had to attract. Yang did go, uh, I wouldn't say he's full on woke, but he did try to appeal to some of that crowd, the woke crowd in the Democratic Party, well, or just he I'm wanted good, even, good relations with the Democratic establishment. I'm not even talking about the woke crowd. I'm the general American populace, you offer them $1,000 and they still turn it down. So a thousand dollars a month or whatever. So at this point, you realize you're dealing with something less than human, and then you're dealing with the subhuman. And I don't think Yang was at his age is able to internalize the the simian or the low nature of the American mind. Uh, yeah, I've heard that theory before, but can you explain specifically what you mean about the nature of the American mind and how Americans well, would contrast with people in other parts of the world? Well, uh, and again, this is traveling through America. We've heard from conservatives for several generations about the dumbing of the American mind and about this how Americans are how American schools are teaching kids so many use, useless things and the curriculums are being dumbed down. Well, that process has culminated at this time in basically producing a generation that is finally completely ignorant and basically incapable of rational thought or in mo- most cases only prepared to be a consumer. So those people are no longer rational political actors. And the thing is, is, as you pointed out earlier, is they don't necessarily need need all those consumers. No, exactly. But people don't realize that they're the consumers, but they can't protect themselves anymore because they don't have the, the intelligence or the knowledge to be basic voters anymore. Since you were on Yang, uh, I mean, I support the UBI, but I'm also skeptical. I don't think at the same time, I think even with a UBI, we'd still have a lot of these uh, these problems of a sort of planned uh, obsolescence. Well, I'm actually a Luddite in the sense that I don't believe we're going to achieve total automation because the total automation of society will be outweighed by the fact that so many people are reverting to a a pre-human form. So we talk about transhumanism and post-humanism, but most people are reverting to pre-humanism. So to uh, levels prior to the civilization of mankind. So what are, you know, what's going to happen once there, it's like a seesaw and the balance is going to tip Either way, and yes, there are some people in the middle of it who are educated and rational and so forth and so on, but you have your transhumanists on one side, but there are far more millions of people who are completely uh, borderline human. So the scale is going to, you know, it's going to be like a seesaw ride for a while. But to your point, uh, the, the people in Heartland America, by and large, are no longer necessary because it's true that they could run the factories with far fewer people than there And you're are. talking about without, even without automation and outsourcing. Yeah, without automation, they could run the factory on one-third of the people that currently 
uh, work in those factories. And they could run all the farms with one third of the labor that they're running the work with now. So, and I, and that's not just an imaginary statement. I'm just pulling out of thin air. What we're seeing right now, what you see in the heartland is a slow conglomeration of farmland as a few corporations and large farmers start to buy up every possible chunk of land, farmable, arable land in the area, in the regions and push people into cities in which they live in these, uh, these developments and, you know, these, uh, housing developments and the small landowners are being eliminated because they're not functional. They can't mm -hmm. produce crops and, and so they're basically useless. But a large farm can, of hundreds of thousands of acres, a large corporation can produce a vast amount of resources from those land with only one or two people using tractors. Uh, literally, a handful of people can produce, you know, uh, millions of tons of, uh, of corn and soybeans and so forth uh, without help from anyone else. So that re renders everyone else around them redundant. And they really have no purpose in life. We can't create an artificial purpose from them. For them in life, what we have right now is LARPing, you know, which everybody is live action role playing, imaginary job that's not real. But even if they didn't, if they had a uh, a purpose in their own mind, there would be no actual important purpose for them to exist because we have an overpopulated country, and there's simply not. It's not that we that there's a shortage of jobs. In, as a matter of fact, there's not enough jobs. There's not enough people to fill the few jobs that are around because uh, those jobs are so important and so selective that there's only a small pool of people that can fill those roles. So if so many uh, of the American people are obsolete, why do you think there's such this – there's this really strong push by, the, by corporations and the establishment for mass immigration? Uh, I truly believe that they're trying to do the whole, I think, uh, well, first of all, we know from past experiences that if you create the perfect storm in immigration within two generations, those immigrants will largely disappear. And not just by assimilation, but uh, they're, by the third generation, they will be below uh, reproduction, their reproduction rate will be below replacement. So those immigrants, their descendants will not be able to reproduce at the same rate to even sustain their their original numbers. And we've seen this with every uh, immigration wave in the United States. Their children cannot reproduce at the same rate. So the perfect storm allows them to use the immigrants to help destroy the existing peoples in the United States who are also unnecessary and and then it's easier to get rid of the immigrants. You have these kind of a neoliberal pundits like uh, Matt Iglesias who advocate for 1 billion uh, U.S. citizens by within like 50 years but you don't think you so you don't actually think that's what the establishment wants? Uh, I don't think Matt Iglesias is that important. I think the establishment is very clear with their aims, like a lot of uh, long-term United Nations projection maps will show you that large they project large areas of the world and the United States to be vacant in 80 years or in 100 years, and I think we're well on our way to seeing that happen, and I think a lot of pundits are irrelevant to the discussion. What I look at is like in my in the area of the Midwest and I look at individuals who are looking toward the future and there are a lot of people right now who may be buying up thousands of acres of land and uh, planning to use their corporation to run it for their family's benefit in the future. And and what will eventually happen is, yes, they will run that 
land. They will own and control thousands of hundreds of thousands of acres, but the fact that a few, a smaller number of people will every generation control more land will be easier. It will make it easier to eliminate that small number of people um, from controlling the the land. In other words, a lot of small landholders are harder to deal with than a few big landholders, and so those big landholders will be uh, eliminated in due course as they. There was a foreclosure crisis that happened uh, about, yeah, like about 12 years ago. And then prior to that, a lot of, I think it may have been back in the Reagan, Reagan area or maybe Bush Sr., I forget the exact date, but a lot of the small farms, there was a foreclosure crisis where involving the small farms and then there was this mass consolidation. Yeah, and that's, that's just going to continue over and over again until the population can and, you know, it'll go along in cohesion with the population decreases, which I don't think, like I said, Matt Inglesias is pretty, he's just not important to anybody's worldview. You have to see the pattern of our actual elites and how they run things and how they intend to run things. And, you know, the big elites don't necessarily uh, talk to the small elites. I, I explain to people, if you're not a millionaire, you really don't matter in the United States. And I know a bunch of millionaires, and they feel like everybody is out to get them. And, yes, they are wealthy, but it's like they live the kind of life that middle-class Americans used to live. So Yeah, being have, a millionaire is just like the new middle class, that's all. Yeah, and uh, so those are the people that – feel as though they have a target on their backs, but nonetheless, they aren't that important. No, but nobody talks to them and considers their long-term plans. And, and then you have the multimillionaires of a hundred million or more over them. And then you have the, you know, the just under the billionaires above them. And there are a lot more billionaires than people know about because they a, hide lot their assets. Of, a lot of people hide their assets. Um, there are, I, I, I couldn't even hazard a guess to how many billionaires there are in the United States. With hiding the assets, that's why there was some skepticism. What Bernie was proposing about whether an asset tax would work and how you'd collect it. I think there's a lot of solutions that could work if they were implemented by the right group of capable people. Yeah, whether... I think Bernie, like Bernie, he had a lot of his ideas were good, but I just... I honestly don't think he would be the right, the most capable person to, to implement them. Well, Bernie didn't have any capable people around him to implement them either. You know what I mean? What we saw from the Ron Paul campaign, Robert, which I know you were yeah, yeah, I was proxy to it, was that, that not, well. not a whole lot of the people involved in the Ron Paul campaign and the Ron Paul movement were that... It, over time, it turned out that none of them ever amounted to a hill of beans. We'll put it that way. They got like Justin Am Amish elected. He's not. He doesn't oppose really any serious opposition to the establishment. And a lot well, of the he, Ron Paul, like the Ron Paul types, they got. They had some presence in like libertarian think tanks, but then that was kind of purged by more like the Koch brother types. Yeah, they they were utterly impotent. Exactly. And, I don't think there's a single person from the Ron Paul campaign that I knew or worked with that I still talk to. Some of them are passed away, may they rest in peace, and a lot of them are just uh, basically shit libs. Uh, and uh, none of them ever came to amount to anything. Um, none of them. And here's something else I'll offer: none of nobody talks about Austrian economics anymore. Which, uh, you know, it's obviously Austrian economics are kind of stupid. I didn't even believe in Austrian economics when I was a Ron Paul supporter because, you know, I'm not a person who believes in the free market. But, you know, nobody, Austrian economics, I, 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 ne I, I never hear anybody talk about Austrian economics. No, no, economics. not at all. It's, they've been completely removed from everybody's mindset. But the point of the matter is, I think a lot of plans from different people, be it Yang, be it Bernie, be it any innovator, 
could be implemented, but they have to be implemented by a particular cast of people who are dedicated and disciplined and capable. And I don't think any but Americans, there's, there's no group of Americans that you could get together that are dedicated and disciplined and capable. That of any ilk or race or creed or political bent. And with this uh, planned obsolescence, but I don't think it's going to be like an, an outright genocide, but I think what will happen is just people will be granted subsistence living just to get by, like basic food and shelter, and then with the kind of uh, declining birth rates, they'll just sort of gradually be phased out, like a slow, maybe you could say like a slow genocide. Yeah, absolutely. It's a slow, controlled genocide, and it's working according to plan. And everything is going, you know, at this point, I could never, there's nobody you can talk to about have their own genocide. In other words, you can't go to these people and say, white genocide or... You're not even talking about it in ethnic terms. You're saying it's everyone. I think every ethnicity is being targeted because I, I think uh, I think they want to decrease the population by you know, a hundred or two or even 200 million. And I realized the population of America is not that high or not, uh, not as crazy high as China and these other countries. But, uh, I don't think our elites take, uh, the wars with, uh, or the whole conflicts with other nations seriously because they're also invested in other nations as well. And, moreover, you have a situation in which America is basically a, like South Africa, is a, it's a breadbasket. It's not meant to be a suburb. And, and it really doesn't work that well as a suburb. What do you when, mean by a breadbasket uh, versus a suburb? Like, what, which country I would mean, be a breadbasket? Because the United States does produce well, a lot of food. Well, we look at Egypt, where people largely live in cities, and uh, or South Africa, or what what was formerly uh, Rhodesia, which uh, in which people largely live in cities, and the countryside is largely agricultural. And then we look at America right now, which in which the countryside is being eaten up by suburbanization, and these cities are spreading. Um, some of these cities are 15 to 20 to 30 miles wide, you know, 40 miles wide. The city limits are spread in all directions in order to get more federal funding for their, so they can have public water and public sanitation and, and all this at, at higher rates. But And they're eating up the farmland right now for uh, building houses and McMansions and all that. But I don't think that is feasible in the long run. I think the elites are just letting that go on right now. But in the long term, America is just, all of that is going to go away, and America is just going to be used as a breadbasket for the world. In other words, it's just going to be farmland. Oh, so right. you're saying that kind of, uh, kind of how South Africa functions as the breadbasket for sub-Saharan Africa, the United States functions that as a breadbasket for the world? It will be... It will be used as a breadbasket for the world after the population's reduction. I mean, it, it, it is right now as well, but it will be more so. And I think that's the elite's plan more than it is to allow unchecked immigration and suburbanization. You know, like we're going to live in one giant suburb from California to Massachusetts. It's just going to be those, you know, row houses after row houses. In some ways, like there could be some aspects where the quality of life might actually be higher than it is now for some people. Like the, there might be certain ways if things go as you're talking about, but for the the vast majority, it will be it'll be pretty ugly. Well, I have a unique perspective because I see both sides, and that's because I want to see both sides. Some days I'm around the ultra rich. And some days I choose to go to trailer parks just to study things and talk to. How would you describe like your personal like background as far as your class and, and overall oh, background? Well, that's it's kind of complex because my great my ancestor was uh, George Washington's 
uh, quartermaster general for a while in the Continental Army. So I have what do they call heritage American background, and I also have Native American background. And uh, but uh, I'm pretty from pretty blue collar stock overall, even though I have some more illustrious ancestors. So it's been kind of downhill <coughs> for the last century. As far uh, as interviewing people, like, do you have you covered the whole theme of like the deaths of despair, alcoholism, uh, opioids, and suicide? I, I have. One of the big chunks of the documentary is going to do with uh, meth, because meth is more prevalent in the heartland than the opo opioids, though opioids are very prevalent. In fact, opioids are so prevalent that they cut meth. Uh, um, they cut the meth with, uh, with uh, heroin. And uh, so meth is not the same meth that it was when we think of methamphetamines in the past, you know, that speeds up people. It's actually a whole, it has morphed into something else now. It's both a painkiller and a stimulant because it's cut with heroin. And heroin is so prevalent, uh, even though, but nevertheless, it's not common in an opioid form. It's common in meth, in, in the... Uh, the cut meth, uh, what they call Mexican ice, that is manufactured in Mexico and uh, actually subsidized by Walmart, believe it or not. Though I don't know if we'll go into that in the documentary. Walmart did play a role in destroying a lot of a lot of small town America, but that's not so much. You're documenting the ongoing issues. That was a huge issue in the '80s and '90s. Well, the the deal I can talk about that on this show, but the deal with Walmart is. Walmart uses vendors for everything, and a lot of its vendors are from Mexico, and they also happen to own the actual factories, because meth is made in factories now. It's, it's not just made in, people think of people cooking meth in the United States in a bath, bathtub or whatever, people don't do that, or Walter White cooking meth, you know, in his home laboratory. There's no money in that. The lab, uh, right now, they mass produce math in factories uh, in Mexico. And consequently, uh, Walmart uses its vendor connections or helps the vendors with their connections to basically bring tons of math into the country every year. So a lot of people are on meth uh, and use it as a painkiller more because it's cut with heroin. And yes, there are a lot of people on, her uh, her on opioids as well, fentanyl and so on, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very commonplace now in, in any case. And certainly what's going happening to white people is what was happening to uh, Native American Indians. If you look up ethnic statistics on suicides, the two highest groups are it's actually both whites and Native Americans with the other groups as being lower. Why do you think it's those two groups? Uh, they're redundant people. And when they say whites, we largely mean the Scots-Irish, uh, some Italians, Germans, uh, those people of those particular descent, you know, uh, Nordic whites, uh, some Southern European whites, so forth and so on. But uh, like I said, the genocide has been going on the reservation on the reservations for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So it's hard to feel particular sympathy for the whites when they watch the, gener the genocide going on, you know, to, other, to the Indians for a long time. And, you know, there was no easy solution to the problem. And, you know, some of the uh, particular tribes were able to solve the problem by starting a like a, a tribal company in which all the men were, were employed in construction or something like that. that Do you have a uh, family on reservations, or are you fairly assimilated into sort of mainstream American society? I'm fairly assimilated, but I do have relations on reservations. Do you talk about what's going on with uh, cash businesses, such as gas stations, motels, uh, laundromats, 
You mean uh, in the in the documentary? Yeah, well, I mean a lot of them are obviously immigrant owned. I was really but what's the significance of them? I was really bothered for a long time by the fact that they're all forms of cash businesses are foreign owned. And again, this goes back to talking about the reservations and the Indians and giving them, you know, giving the tribes casinos and so forth, which were immediately taken over by the mafia. So the Indians are just getting a small pittance from the casino, uh, and the, you know, various mafias and cartels are reaping the rewards from the large profits from the casinos and giving the tribes a very small amount uh, from of the of the profits. So what happens with the, the gas stations, any cash business has been farmed out to some foreign cartel family clan or something. So you see Pakistanis, Indians running gas stations, you'll see Chinese running laundries and so forth and so on. And this and, isn't just in these traditional immigrant gateways like New York and California. You'll, I mean, this is, no. you'll see this in small towns in Alabama. Yes. in every, every gas station in America is owned by, an Indian, or every hotel is owned, I'm an East Indian, every hotel is owned by Pakistani and so forth and so on. And what these people are, people don't understand the clan structure. The deal is that the U.S. intelligence has made a deal with certain clans in Pakistan and India to allow their people, their families, to withdraw large amounts of cash from America in order for their support against China. And so forth. With China, well, China was being built up through the 90s of the neoliberal free trade era, but now China is being vilified as like fascist. So India is being built up as this rival, to, as a counterbalance to China. Well, all through the 90s, India was being built up too. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think we have to remember that the elites don't all get along, and that's where conspiracy conspiracy theorist. Uh, they view elites as just one monolithic entity. When there are divisions, like you said, there's the different layers, from the hundred million multimillionaires to billionaires, and then the millionaires at the bottom. The thing is, like, there's also ideological divisions. So that's what conspiracy theorists get wrong. They have this. They have this kind of vision that there's just this one tiny group that meets in secret. When it's this whole, it's this whole apparatus in general. It's not just this one tiny shadowy group. Yeah, I would imagine that the different groups uh, supporting China and India coexist at the moment, and whether they intend to continue doing so. It's like the groups that support Israel, you know, and Saudi yeah, because there's like there's factions of the establishment that are less friendly to Israel. It's not monolithic. Yeah, exactly. So the so all this is going on, but. Nobody considers American interests or the interests of the Americans. And what they would tell you if you confronted them with that is, hey, we had to give all these cash businesses away to foreigners in order to main, use their clout to maintain peace. Through, uh, in other words, to buy friends abroad. Otherwise, we'd already be in a shooting war with China. And so consider a small price to pay that instead of owning a gas mm -hmm. station, you're working construction or working in, you know, some other field that most uh, native-born Americans go into because you're, you don't have access to that easy cash because so we don't have to, you have to sacrifice your access to that easy cash so we don't have a hot war with China right now or a hot war with Russia. That's what they would say is as their justification for uh, enabling you know foreigners to basically take over all these easy businesses. As far as providing jobs, do you have personal solutions to what, what can be done? I mean, this whole idea of like kind of make work jobs, but there are kind of also there's what society can do as a whole, and then there are these kind of uh, economic niches of so these different tribes you're talking about. They also have businesses that are passed down through the family, and that's kind of how that's probably more how it used to be. But there is just this kind of radical individualist uh, mindset in this country where everyone has to kind of start from scratch. Or I'd say like anyone in the bottom eighty, eighty per, or even ninety percent, there's this mentality that everyone has to start from scratch. 
Well, Highland was a neoliberal, and he said specialization is for insects. And I very much disagree with him. I think that specialization is important, and I think for those people that do survive this current trend, it's going to be a father passing down his trade to his son, and people engaging, having some appreciation for family inheritances, trying to leave stuff to their children, trying to consider their family as the basis for their future. Yeah, I mean, there's, and, uh, there's, you go to like some towns in Europe and you have, you have people who the same, like the same business that maybe be, might be like an inn and the same like heirlooms, like it's all been passed down like many generations. I mean, part of it is just America, how America was created as like a frontier society where everything is disposable and you restart from scratch. You move one area one area has problems and you keep moving further west, but like neoliberalism kind of, uh, it accelerates that, that whole trend in American culture where everything is disposable and each generation starts from scratch. Well, my theory on that, on starting from scratch, is that America is geographically speaking not meant to really be inhabited like Europe. And I, what I mean by that is. America is fundamentally, the way the geography lays, it makes people nomadic. And that's why the American Indians and all the tribes were nomadic. And what you see is that the whites who settled the America, the American continent, have become nomadic. <laughs> well, um, not by their own choosing, but they have inadvertently become nomadic by the fact that they could not build that kind of environment that was in Europe. And there's many reasons for that, but I think geography is one of them. Just the, na the very nature of the geography in the United States causes people to become nomadic. And so they want to start over. They have no choice to start over. At first it becomes a desire, then it becomes a matter of life or death. You know, you have to start over somewhere else. You can't make it here anymore. You can't make it there anymore. You've got to do something else. You've got to go somewhere else. And that just becomes inevitable for 90% of the population. You saw that documentary, TFW, No GF. Alex Lee Moyer, she touches upon economics briefly, but would you say the, the people portrayed in that documentary, are they relevant to what you're doing with yours? I think mine is more... I'm looking for... A, a different class of people that maybe I can, I feel more comfortable in interacting with that I feel like are more heritage Americans because everybody can have the facsimile of being a heritage American, but unless you can trace your direct ancestor ancestry back to the thirteen colonies or beyond that, you know, you're not really a heritage American. It's very easy to profile white people in general. But it's hard to profile particular Americans. And what I found is that the heritage Americans, like people who are descended from actual settlers, are being, I consider them to be particularly targeted. So with these different, these kind of these different, like, blocks in the country, like the people of the Midwest and the people of the South and where they trace their ancestry to, as far as, like, which groups are having more, like, which groups are more de deracinated, which groups have more social cohesion based on their own lifestyle, and then which groups are being more uh, targeted? Well, Robert, first of all, I'd like to answer that with uh, uh, an important, one of the most important things when you're studying this matter is to understand that the greatest currency in the world today is anonymity. And our elites have the most... <laughs> Of this currency so uh, it's hard to profile our elites in general no, I'm not talking about the top secret Bohemian Grove I'm talking about the lower tire elites tier elites you know any elites take advantage of anonymity for themselves and their families as much as possible so it's very hard to profile the elites and Insofar as what I have profiled them, I'm afraid to talk about them in particular. Now, 
On the other hand, it's very easy to profile the peasants and the helots. One example I'll give is that looking at at suicide rates is that in the south there is a lot of poverty, but suicide rates are lower, actually lower in the south, deep south, than they are in the Rust Belt because they still have stronger uh, social cohesion. I think there's more Christianity in the Deep South than the Rust Belt, but it's it's starting to fade as well. I told one of the lines I liked in an interview in the documentary was saying the Southern Baptists went from beer to meth in one generation or less, and so that's ongoing right now, you know. So uh, that is, well, there's some groups like say say Mormons in Utah. Do you see them thriving more in the long term? I think the Mormons have their own deal with the elites in the government. There are a lot of Mormons in the deep state, so they're thriving much more, but you would say, is it... I think the groups that are going to survive are the ones that make a deal with the elites and are strong enough to stand up for themselves to a certain degree. And those groups are not necessarily in the forefront right now. In other words, um, they're going to become more evident over time, be they Mormons or Jehovah's Witness or, you know, there are going to be various different organizations that make a truce with the elites and are able to survive the uh, the purges down the road. But with your documentary, I know there's the stories, the, the documenting these communities that have been uh, devastated. But what are you going to do in the documentary to make your point about the future trends, about what you what you see happening, what you predict is going to happen? I don't know how much predictions I'm going to put into the documents documentary specifically. What I wanted to do more uh, is uh, document or actually make a record of all the small towns. Like, well, there's um, there's literally thousands of small towns that might have had a factory, two gas stations, a cafe, a couple of other buildings. They might have had less than a thousand people in them, but they had some business going on. And they're all that's slowly dying. The buildings are falling in, the wind, the glass is broken, the the you know, everything is falling apart. There are a few residences left in the town. There's a post office. But by and large, everything is falling apart. Everything is decaying. Everybody in the town is on drugs. The mayor, the chief of police, they, are, they, you know, they go and hang out in city hall and hit the crack pipe. And this is not exceptional or unusual. But and I don't really want to necessarily draw conclusions on this. I just merely want to just document or leave a record of all this happening with documentaries. Some documentaries are explicitly political, I agree. I think it would be more effective if you just tell the stories without any specific, any explicit political angle. Well, at this point, I don't know who to be political for, again, because the vast majority, the a prerequisite for being political is having human beings, and uh, if you don't have any human beings, you can't have politics. And we're dealing with a large quantity of zombies in the United States who are never going to be awakened from their stupor to the reality of their situation. And were they awakened from their stupor, they would be incapable of any kind of intelligent action to prevent their own downfall. Mm -hmm. So, again, the best thing to do is just to leave that history behind in film. We touched on this already, but what, what outcomes do you see happening the long-term trends that we should look out for after the pandemic? Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of, uh, of uh, people selling, uh, well, ha- like the whole meat shortage. I think there's going to be a lot of more local sales of meat. Because oh, yeah, plus- because the, what's going on, it does, it does bring light to a lot of the problems of uh, factory farming. Especially, I mean, a lot of people who, who maybe were not like, Hardcore environmental rights activists or environmentalists are finding out a lot of the ugly sides. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot more local selling of meat from individual owners. So in other words, small beef producers for the time being, while they still exist, are going to be selling more beef out of their own uh, local places to individuals and for the time being in the short term. 
uh, in the long term, I think they're going to potentially try to cut down on the sales of beef overall in the country because uh, beef is a nourishing uh, sustenance for the population that they want to reduce. So I, I really see them cutting drastically back on the amount of beef available to the public. And uh, chicken and uh, pork are food for more docile people, so they'll be feeding them more of the factory farm chicken and pork. And uh, I see, uh, again, a lot of businesses closing, but primarily what's interesting, and one of the things I have no I've noticed in the last couple of years, and I want to document in this documentary, are the number of small town banks that are being closed because banks are in every small town in in America. No matter how run down the town is, it usually has a nice bank. And when the bank dies, the whole town dies. So I was I wanted to chronicle all these little banks. Not necessarily independent banks, a lot of them are chain banks, but uh, all the little banks that are being pulled out of businesses by the chains or uh, basically rendered uh, closed down and unavailable to the uh, people. So I see that continuing. Once the banks go, the businesses will no longer have a lifeline because all they do is borrow money from the banks and the banks hold the mortgages and all that. So once the banks go, people are not going to have that lifeline of credit anymore. So that's going to make life harder for them and for anybody who wants to invest or get a loan to start a business, it's going to be virtually impossible. Yeah, I see that happening. You know, in the, in, as a result partially of this coronavirus, this whole epidemic and uh, the quarantine is that the, a lot of the banks were carrying so many mortgages for public properties or p businesses, restaurants, and so forth and so on. Yeah, it will lead to this kind of kind of mass consolidation where the bigger banks and, and real estate uh, firms will, well, what I said earlier with the farms, of the businesses that become bankrupt or foreclosed, They'll just be this mass buy-up. So I think like these trends of income inequality will definitely accelerate. Uh, I think income inequality is it's uh, like I said. There's the, we're we're returning to normal, and it may take a long time to return to normal. And of course, equality inequality is the normal norm for humanity, unfortunately, and. We have to deal with the fact that Americans were living in a a uh, imaginary utopia for about 50 years prior to World War II, but that time is over, and that's time to suffer. Do you have examples from other parts of the world that countries that are ahead of us that that basically show that we're the direction we're headed, like where we could be in say 30 years? Uh, I think Brazil, with its favelas, is uh, California is certainly going to look like Brazil with its favelas. But what people don't understand is that Brazil is a political crucible, and those favelas, they're not uh, the overpopulation that produced them is being reduced at this time through birth control and various methods. So yes. Uh, the, the United States, particularly California and other states like that, are going to resemble Brazil for a while, but people think it's going to be a permanent condition. It's nothing. Nothing's permanent, as Heraclitus pointed out. You know, history is a river, and the water passes by. So, but we are going to have to deal with favelas, and in a lot of places, you can document, like you get out of the nice inner part of town in cities. Oh, the new gonna, thing is like. There used to be like the inner city ghetto and the white flight to the suburbs, but actually the new trend now is suburban ghettos. Uh, I mean, you're in the Midwest. I think the best example of that would be uh, Ferguson. But the thing is, they exist uh, for the white proletariat as well. Well, Ferguson is a was a suburb. I don't know what exactly happened with Ferguson. I, I actually that's that's a long. I've been through. I've been to Ferguson. It's, 
you're talking about just these kind of like slum slum like communities just popping up all over the country. Well, let's let's look at St. Louis in general. St. Louis does not have a reason to exist anymore. St. Louis was a Riverport town, and it's no longer a Riverport town because the Mississippi River is no longer used for serious, you know, economic business for the most part. And so St. Louis doesn't have factories. It doesn't have uh, industry. It doesn't have agriculture. It doesn't have a real reason to exist. It's just a conglomeration of population, and it's it's... Again, I use the word crucible. It's a crucible of peoples uh, fighting amongst each other. You have the Bosnians and the blacks and the Hispanics and all these different peoples, ethnicities fighting for a piece of the pie. But there's nothing in St. Louis of value particularly. The city is not worth anything. So what happens is general ghettofication. I know that's not a word, but uh, the whole city is turning into a ghetto from the inside out. That's, <laughs> you know. And for you go downtown in St. Louis, it looks like a war zone. Then you go outside to the suburbs, it also doesn't look that great, you know? Paul, do you have a website to promote yourself or to promote this project? And are you doing anything to raise funds like a Kickstarter? I'm, I'm uh, fixing to start a Patreon, but I don't really have one up yet. But I think enough people know who I am where they can get a hold of me and give me money. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Oh, I guess Facebook. Uh, my my name, Paul Bingham, the number's 4, four at yahoo.com. Yeah, I'm just saying that's, uh, that's the best way to reach me. Paul Bingham, it has been an excellent show. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Robert. I enjoyed talking to you.